Welcome back. All right, so I want to do a career video today. I looked it up. I have not done a career video on Marcus Naslin. I don't know how that's the thing. So first off, obviously, going into the THG Hall of Fame uh, as being a player who played through a few eras. He he spanned a few different eras. And it's interesting because, you know, he, he saw the best of it and the worst of it and sometimes in the same season. So he was drafted number 16 in 1991. Now, if he had come over to the NHL and started playing right away, who knows? Maybe he becomes a star player a little sooner. Maybe it works out a little better. But he doesn't. He ends up staying home and playing in moto for a couple of seasons. So he becomes a free agent because he hadn't signed a contract. So we've seen like undrafted, like drafted players at some point. They don't sign with the team that drafted them. They can become free agents. So he does. It's a restricted free agency situation. So if teams make an offer, Pittsburgh can match. Pittsburgh lets the NHL know we will match no matter what anybody does. So Nazland is forced to sign with Pittsburgh as a result. He ends up signing in September of that year, and it just didn't work in Pittsburgh. It just didn't. Uh, from the beginning, it was obvious. 71 games, 4 goals, 7 assists, 11 points. So this video, I, I, I want to point this out, that there are a lot of players right now who are being regarded as busts, who played less games than that. Certainly that conversation was had about Marcus, Nas Marcus Naslin coming out of his rookie season. But this was a pretty full Pittsburgh team when it came to offensive weapons, right? So Naslin needs to play an offensive role, and he wasn't being given that opportunity. 94-95, a lockout shortened season. He still only plays 14 games for Pittsburgh. Two goals, two assists for four points. And so while he's called up to during you know the playoff runs they have those years, he's a healthy scratch both times. And he was um, really, honestly, not all that happy in Pittsburgh. He wanted a trade. Pittsburgh doesn't trade him until the following season. In training camp, he plays well. But he's already been labeled by the media as Mr. September because he does normally play well in training camp. He has good preseasons and then in the regular season, eh, not that great. But in Pittsburgh that year, he plays 66 games, 19 goals, 33 assists, 52 points. And then they trade him. Now, I still, I look back at this, at this deal and I think, you know what? This is a Pittsburgh team that had skill and they were looking for toughness. Vancouver had a tough guy in Alex Stoyanov that was a first-round draft pick. Hadn't shown any offensive acumen at the NHL level at this point. But Naslin, while he was on a pretty good run with Pittsburgh, I, I think they felt that this was from playing with a guy named Mario. And that maybe these offensive totals weren't reflective as much about Naslin as they were about who, they, who he was playing with. So he's traded for Alex Stoyanov on March 20th. We would all look back on this trade years later, now, as in, for instance as one of the most lopsided trades in history. However, at the time that trade's made, it's an understandable one from both perspectives. Vancouver wants more talent in the lineup and they want young talent in the lineup. So he plays 10 games with Vancouver. He gets three goals in those 10 games. He gets them all in the season finale. And I remember this because after that ninth game, when he had no points, there was certainly already a lot of talk amongst Vancouver fans about whether or not he was gonna live up to the hype. You know, first round draft pick being brought in, but is it going to be worth it? He gets that hat trick in the final game of the year to help the Canucks qualify for the Stanley Cup playoffs. In said playoffs, they play six games, one goal, two assists for three points. But what's happened is Nazaland is now on a team that's going through some stuff. There are some things going on with the Canucks. 96-97, 78 games played for Vancouver, 21 goals, 20 assists for 41 points. A 20-goal season is, is good. It's respectable. And that was seen as, okay, so his points totals have dropped off. He had 55 the year before, but he's not playing with Mario in Vancouver. So not playing with a guy named Yager either. So, you know, he, again, it's not bad, right? So 97-98 plays 76 games, only 14 goals, 20 assists, 34 points. And that's where a lot of the bust discussion was coming in. And there was also discussions of, you know, Naslund, it doesn't look like he's going to reach that level that was expected when he, he's drafted 16th overall in 91, which was a very good draft. So maybe maybe it's time. And not only that, but under Mike Keenan, he scratched. And when Mike Keenan decides he should be a healthy scratch, Naslund requests a trade. Decides, you know, maybe this isn't going to work in Vancouver. And Naslund was never scared to speak out if, if he felt like things weren't going well whether it's himself, the te his teammates, the team, or just in general. Uh, so it was a rough year 
that was a, a very rough year with Mike Keenan and, and uh, yeah, really tumultuous time for the Canucks. This is where you get into the Mark Messier era. So 98-99 and 80 games played, he, he finally shows that he's going to reach that potential. 36 goals, 30 assists, 66 points. It is this year where we start seeing the Stoyanov, Nazland, wow, was this ever lopsided kind of comments. He plays in the All-Star game, but keep in mind, he's drafted in 1991. He doesn't become an All-Star until 98. So if you're if you're criticizing players drafted over the last couple years, maybe pump the brakes a little bit because those comments may not age very well. 99-2000, uh, 82 games, 27 goals, 38 assists, 65 points. I, I mean, it's they're, they're good totals overall. And then the question becomes one of, okay, so what is his ceiling, right? Well, he's almost a, a decade out from his draft year, so 65, 66 points, that's good. But in 2000, 2001, he reaches that next level. And this is where we start getting into, um, you know, which line is he going to end up on and how are things going to turn out? So 72 games, 41 goals, 34 assists, 75 points. March 16th, he breaks his leg against the Buffalo Sabres. So that keeps him out for the rest of the regular season. He's not able to make an appearance in the postseason. But he played in the All-Star game that year, and he became their team captain, the 2000-2001 season. So this is an interesting captaincy to look at. He replaces Marc Messier as captain, and the captain after he left was Roberto Luongo. So you go from the Messier era, that Canuck fans aren't all that big of fans of, to the Luongo era, which was just weird with Luongo being the captain. So he is your traditional, normal, popular captain in between an unpopular captain and a bewildering captain. So 2001-2002, he becomes an all-star uh, beyond and above what he was before that. 81 games played, 40 goals. So while his 41 goals was 7th in the NHL in 2000-2001, his 40 goals was actually 5th the year after. Uh, remember, this is the era where there's not being not a lot of goals being scored. 56 or 50 assists, I should say, which is 4th in the NHL and 90 points, which is 2nd. That wouldn't be 2nd right now, and we're about almost a month away from the uh, the end of the season, well, three weeks be before the end of the season. He makes his uh, playoff return after six years off, six games, one goal, one assist, two points. So he's a first-team All-Star, left winger, right? Uh, All-Star game, absolutely. He was fifth in heart voting, and this is where you get into the West Coast Express era. The West Coast Express, of course, was Todd Bertuzzi, uh, Brendan Morrison and Marcus Nasland. But the interesting part is that Bertuzzi's point totals would be very good. Naslund's were great. But Morrison, I always felt like he was better off as a second line center. And that, that era for Vancouver, they they talk a lot about goaltending, which I understand. Brian Burke, of course, GM at the time. He went with Cluche. He was absolutely loyal to Cluche. I thought sometimes to a fault. But for, for the Canucks... Uh, I always thought one of the one of the failings of that team too was depth down the middle. Um, it, it, it was it was absolutely an issue that they had through that era. And as much as I liked Morrison, still think he was one of the most heart and soul players they had. Uh, I I really thought you know if he was the second line center, if they had a really true number one center, they didn't really have that. So 2002 2003, his career year, 82 games, 48 goals, which was second. Uh, 56 assists, which was 8th in the National Hockey League. 104 points, which is 2nd. It's the only year he reaches 100 points. And in the playoffs, 14 games, 5 goals, 9 assists, 14 points. Uh, he wins the Ted Lindsay Award as the player's choice for the, for, the, for, the most, for the best player in the league. He's a first-team All-Star. He goes to the All-Star game. His 24 power play goals are 2nd in the NHL. He had 57 power play points overall, which is ridiculous. Uh, he's 2nd in heart voting. And this is the, 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 the time where he famously said, we choked. I thought at the time, you know, it's nice to have a captain who comes out and admits in front of the fans, hey, we, we blew it. I'm sorry. But, of course, we choked kind of became this big rally for, for non-Vancouver fans. Um, and the West Coast Express, the biggest problem, too, wasn't just that the Canucks down the middle didn't have that depth. It wasn't just that at playoff time they didn't have a goaltender that they could really rely on for winning those best of seven series. The West Coast Express had 45% of Vancouver's goals. So when you hold Marcus Naslin to the five goals in 14 games, 
you're likely beating the Canucks. So what happens is that because the West, West Coast Express is 45% of your offense, when it has a struggle in the playoffs, people point their fingers at the West Coast Express and go, they're the problem. The Sedins had not become what they're going to be yet. The Sedins were slow developing, same as Nasland had been in his career. So, yeah, uh, 70, 78 games played the following season, 35 goals, which was 7th in the NHL, 49 assists, which is ninth, 84 points, which is 4th. So he's top four in NHL scoring three years in a row. In the playoffs, seven games played, two goals, seven assists, nine points. They lost in the first round that year against Calgary. And I knew going into game seven that the odds of them winning it were, were long. It felt like the 0-4 Flames were, just, they just had something going the Canucks didn't. So he's a first-team All-Star again. Uh, he's an All-Star game appearance, or he has an All-Star game appearance that season as well. He was fifth in heart voting. But the 16th of February, absolutely a, a day of infamy for Canuck fans. Uh, he is hit by Steve Moore. Uh, fans are not happy about the Steve Moore hit, neither are the Canucks. He gets a concussion, and he hyperextends his elbow on that hit. So the NHL decides to do nothing on that. There, there was no discipline. And, and again, we can all have that debate about whether or not there should be supplemental discipline with any incident. Steve Moore's incident on, on Nasla notwithstanding. And then the Canucks... They throw some not-so-thinly veiled threats that way. Uh, of course, famously, it's Bertuzzi that ends up following through on said threats. It would negatively impact Bertuzzi's career. It also negatively impacted Naslin. So while I felt like after that injury, he was never quite the same level of player, uh, he admitted later he, he was upset. He felt like, you know, Todd was out there trying to defend him. And he, he felt bad about everything that took place. Obviously felt horrible about what happened to Steve Moore after. But it just, it was, it was a disaster overall. So 0405 during the lockout wiped out season, he does play for Moto because it's what he does, right? He, he loves his hometown team. Uh, 0506 after the lockout, it's not the same. So what's interesting is that he was an unrestricted free agent going into that season. He decides to return to Vancouver, signs at $6 million per season, which was a, a contract that was controversial based on how he produced during that contract. 81 games played, no 506. 32 goals, 47 assists, 79 points. And so he's dropped out of the top 10s. He's not an all-star. He's not, you know, in the in the running for, for votes when it comes to MVP or anything like that. But still, 32 goals, 79 points is good, but you could see he wasn't the same player he had been in 0203. 06-07, it's his first year under Ilan Vigneault. So they get rid of Mark Crawford after 0506. They go to Ilan Vigneault. Vigneault's a more defensive-minded coach. I mean, you can get your offense, but it's more of a defensive game, and it negatively impacts Marcus Naslin. 82 games played that first year, 24 goals, 36 assists for 60 points. Dramatic drop in points, dramatic drop in goals. 12 games in the playoffs, 4 goals, 1 assist, 5 points. Now, the other thing that's happened is now we're into the Sedins era. So it is the Sedins team. And so Nasland isn't playing as prominent a role, so that's going to impact his point totals as well. Um, and so that first year under Vino, there was definitely rumblings of Nasland not being happy. 2007-2008, uh, 82 games played again, so he's not missing time. 25 goals, which is one more than he had the previous season. 30 assists, which is six less, so 55 points, a drop of five overall. And the Canucks end up missing the playoffs that year, and he's open about how he's frustrated by Vino's defensive style. It doesn't mesh. It doesn't work for him. And I, again, I always enjoyed Naslin being open and saying exactly how he felt in any given moment. But that's that's the kind of thing too that fans will say, hey, just go out there and play. Just go out there and produce. But he felt like the style of hockey didn't work. It wasn't conducive to his success. So What's interesting too is during this this time, I had I had looked at Naslin's career numbers and I thought, you know, he's going to hit a thousand points. He has to, and that was after the 0506 season. I'm looking at his point totals. I'm going, well, he's dropping, but he should be able to get to a thousand points. Uh, not only did he not get to the thousand points, he didn't retire as a Canuck either, which we all kind of thought he would. Uh, so July 3rd of 2008, he signs as an unrestricted free agent with the Rangers. So that Rangers Canucks crossover, which there very often is in players' careers and coaching careers and all that, it continues. Um, and so that last year he plays with the Rangers, and I remember him scoring in the opening night game uh, for the Rangers, and there being some Canuck fans at the time saying, "See, he's he still got it." So we're going to regret losing him. 
Ends up playing every game for the Rangers that year, 82 games, 24 goals, 22 assists for 46 points. He did play in the playoffs that year, seven games, one goal, two assists, three points. On May 4th, so shortly after the season's done, he announces his retirement. Uh, Naslund was part of a very turbulent time in Vancouver, both here, kind of sort of here, and then of course, as he leaves Vancouver, that's where they're starting to make that improvement. That's where we're starting to see the emergence of Ryan Kessler as a good second line center. We're seeing the emergence of the Sedin twins and what they're going to be able to do. He ends up having a, a career of 1117 games, which again, if he'd come over and played in the NHL sooner, things have been a little smoother in his transition to the NHL with Pittsburgh, he would have played a lot more. 395 goals, 474 assists, 869 points. He only played 52 games in the playoffs. And so that debate can be had as well about whether or not he was good enough or whether or not the team around him was good enough. I can make the argument of both. That yeah, he never quite elevated his game in the playoffs, but for a team playing against the Canucks, it was just let's go ahead and key on the West Coast Express team uh, or West Coast Express line and that'll shut the team down. And generally that worked. So 52 games in the playoffs, 14 goals, 22 assists, 36 points. The Canucks retired his number, number 19, on December 11th of 2020, uh, or 2010. Sorry, I put 2020. 2010. They wouldn't have waited 10 years for that. Uh, 2010, he did play with Peter Forsberg. Uh, what's interesting, too, is that they played together in, in Moto. He came out of retirement to try to prevent Moto being at the bottom of the league. He wanted to help rejuvenate the team and keep him out of that, that bottom spot. But he had tried to get Forsberg to come to Vancouver. He had tried to get Forsberg to sign in Vancouver, and it just never quite worked. And who knows, if Forsberg is a free agent but willing to go to Vancouver, who knows what might have happened, right? Because they had a natural chemistry together. They were really good friends and all that. So, World Championships, he had some success. 1993, he wins silver. That's the same year he wins silver at the World Juniors. So, he played at the Men's Tournament and the Junior Tournament. 1992, he also had World Junior Tournament, and he had the bronze medal at the 1992 and 2002 World Championships. It's too bad that he retires before the 2010 Olympics. Would have been interesting to see if he would have played in Team Sweden for the, the 2010 Olympics and maybe added to his, his medal haul overall. But for Naslin, I think it was a very successful career. Again, obviously a THG Hall of Fame induction. I don't think he ever gets into the uh, Hall of Fame in the NHL. I think if he was going to, he would have by now. But a very good career. And he was the first Swedish player and the first Canuck to win the Ted Lindsay Award, or which, of course, at the time, was the Lester Pearson Award. So, there you go. Let me know your thoughts in the comment section below, as always. Don't forget to hit like and subscribe if you're browsing your way through you just happened upon this video. Thank you guys so much for watching, for all your support. I will talk to you again soon.